Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Welcome to the second installment of our fun-filled, action-packed two weeks of love, peace, dope, sex, Woodstock. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful evening last night. Before I introduce George, is just to note a couple of references that came up yesterday. And many of you may be familiar with these, but some may not be. Uh, the first is the Floridians. Uh, AKA the Acolytes of Richard Florida. How many of you know who Richard Florida is and know who the Floridians are? So about half of you. Um, so maybe it's worth just saying very briefly, Richard Florida is uh, uh, the person who is the best-selling multi-squillion dollar author, 40,000 bucks an hour for lectures, now at the University of Toronto, but for a long time at uh, George, Ma no, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, I'm sorry, in Pittsburgh. And he's the guy who basically peddles all over the world his uh, trilogy, as it were, of how to become a successful post-industrial city. Technology, talent, tolerance. Technology means lots of plugs in the wall. Talent means lots of universities. Tolerance means lots of same-sex couples living together. And all of this means that money will come to where you live. <laughs> just the way you're saying it. <laughs> you're getting the non-40,000 dollar an hour version. <laughs> he has acolytes all over the world. Those of you who are online at the moment can go to his website and discover the various services that can be provided to you by him and his uh, true believers who are known as Floridians. So that's sort of one group and these are people who with varying degrees of success, have gone into cities like Detroit and managed to get, you know, one and a half million dollars out of the burgers of Detroit in order to achieve nothing uh, with a supposed plan for post-industrial reindustrialization. Thank you, George. With the BMW, watch video as one of your options. So if you live uh, almost anywhere in the United States, it's probable that Richard Florida has been through and spoken to your municipal council, your regional councils, whatever administrative agencies there are, and has helped to determine how your city looks. So it's a very important contribution that he has made. The second group that was mentioned yesterday is the creationists. Uh, the creationists are, in some ways, have some overlap with the Floridians. These are the people who are associated with the Queensland University of Technology, it was mentioned yesterday and specifically the big research center there that is run by Stuart Cunningham and John Hartley. How many people here have heard of the creationists and know about them? Okay, so these, are, they, these people also have many true believers around the world, but especially themselves. Uh, and you'll be hearing from John. We can't afford the 40,000 for the Floridian, uh, or indeed even his acolytes, but we can. Can we call John a creationist? Yeah, I have, yeah. He's on television, so you can call it when he speaks to us, so you can call him anything you like. Um, so these folks have basically said that cultural studies and cultural policy are yesterday's people, that what we need is a Schumpeterian model of small business entrepreneurialism. Uh, that Schumpeter model was mentioned yesterday maybe by Andrew, I think, en passant. And that if you like the YouTube, Facebook, social networking notion that locked within each person is the capacity to engage in the formation of expressive culture, to transcend big business, to transcend big government, to have person-to-person -person interconnection. That that is, in a sense, the future of the media, the future of cultural life. Uh, and that all forms of social organization that existed before, be they unions or big corporations or governments, are just completely outmoded. So if you like, it's an attempt at a policy application of cybertarian principles, cybertarian ethoi. At that point, I think it's time for me to finish my little lecture on the creationists, now that I'm having already given my lecture on the Floridians. And it's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to introduce uh, George Udisi. Uh, many of you will be familiar with George. Uh, we used to work together in New York. Now he's uh, in Miami, and I'm out here. Uh, George is one of the foundational figures in cultural studies and specifically the way in which Latin American cultural studies uh, was brokered into the United States and Western Europe and many other parts of the world both for South-North and South-South interactive purposes. 
um, his many, many articles, his extraordinary social networking, be it Cybertarian or otherwise, uh, and his several books, uh, he's had uh, uh, three in the last uh, five years, have been path-breaking contributions. Uh, his notion of culture as a resource, which shows how the commodification and the governmentalization of everyday life uh, has broken down those amateur professional bifurcations that we talked about yesterday, has been extremely influential in the Spanish-speaking world, but also in the English-speaking world. Uh, his new book, which he's been handing around illegal copies of, <laughs> is a breathtaking survey of new music technology. And those of you who've heard him speak before, or those of us like Andrew and myself who've worked with him for many years, know that uh, George is an event in himself. No. Yes. yes. All right. Well, thank you very much, Toby. And uh, thank you, David. And thanks to Irena, who has facilitated, greased the wheels of, of our being here and everyone who's here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give a two-part talk addressing, on the one hand, what I understand to be the philosophical art base foundation for a certain view of the relationship uh, between questions of precarity and uh, utopian possibilities. All right. And the reason I want to do that is I want to segue from there, from a particular view of the role of not art itself, but what's implicit or implicated in art practice, the uh, presumed autonomy that Andrew spoke about and that we also discussed, uh, and uh, pol the political dimensions of that. All right. And from there, segue to, I, I will also preface this now by saying that I detect, textually, in the work of Negri, Lazzarato, Hart, and others, a disdain for a whole other kind of work that we might call cultural development, which has behind it UNESCO, NGOs, a lot of some culture industries people who want to establish sustainable cultural development in cities. So on and so forth. I want to try to get at the heart of why that disdain. All right? And I'll preface it also by saying is that it's seen as just an accommodation to neoliberal capitalism. So we could say that. It's, it's, so, so those efforts for communities who are using their own heritage and expression are just, that's just accommodation to neoliberalism. And then I want to, of course, go into looking at some of those initiatives on that side. So let me begin uh, with, for those of you that haven't uh, read The Expediency of Culture, begin with what I understood to be the philosophical, philosophical and political uh, economic underpinnings of the transformation of culture into resource, which is a precondition for the emergence of a new phase of cultural policy, I argue, that gives a new twist to what Toby called in his well-tempered subject, the discipline or the disciplining of the ethically incomplete subject. It's, it's a new twist beyond just that. Uh, particular uh, process. Culture no longer only prepares elite subjects to run the empire, as Toby said yesterday, or disciplines the working class to be a, li uh, of a labile workforce. Culture itself has become a capital resource, or in Marx's terms, a factor of production. This is obvious in relation to the role of the electronic media, but we've also discussed this in terms of the monetization of people's pleasure and self-expression in reality shows or in social networking. I think we can situate this turn in a slightly older way of looking at it as the penetration of capital logic into the as yet, to the as yet uncolonized recesses of life. You probably all remember Frederick Jameson's characterization of this, of, of this uh, as yet uncolonized as the third world and as the unconscious. Right? And obviously social networking and pleasure and so on and so forth belong to the unconscious part. And perhaps from the perspective of Lazzarato, Negri, Hart, Verno, the culture-based uh, cultural development might belong to the, uh, to the other part, the colonization of uh, the third world. Um, 
I think that since Fred wrote that statement in 1984, we have witnessed myriad new ways in which this is borne out. In a Weberian or Herbert-Massian model, these two would be defined respectively as the source of aesthetic, the unconscious in the third world, as aesthetic expressive rationality and as a form of social organization that is as yet outside the reach of Western regulation. Elaborating on this model, and here I'm rehearsing the chapter, the introductory chapter to the experience of culture. Elaborating on this model, Boaventura de Souza Santos explains that aesthetic expressive rationality and community were overshadowed by the other logics of modern development. On the axis of regulation, the market took precedence over the state and community, although the state has, in some contexts, taken precedence over the market and community. And on the axis of emancipation, the cognitive instrumental rationality of science, which wreaked destruction on nature and helped regulate the body and transform it into a commodity, biotechnology, took precedence over moral, practical, and aesthetic expressive rationalities. All right, these are the Habermasian, the, the three emancipatory, the three regulatory uh, dimensions. As modern emancipation collapsed, here I'm quoting Boaventura, as modern emancipation collapsed into modern regulation under the rule of the market, it ceased to be the other of regulation, to become its double. While revolution and alternative futures no longer seem to threaten capitalist domination, he says, a new sense of insecurity stemming from the fear of uncontrollable developments ensues from the asymmetry between the capacity to act and the capacity to predict. Close quote. Santos's projection of a new utopian paradigm is premised on the activation of a community principle based on solidarity and of an aesthetic expressive principle based on authorship and artifactuality, which in turn should lead to emancipatory alternatives such as the abolishment of the north-south hierarchy, knowledge oriented, shared, uh, to share, knowledge oriented to shared authority, new forms of sociability characterized by weak hierarchies, plurality of powers and laws, fluidity of social relations, and being in the Ibero-American world, he says also, a Baroque-like taste for mixture or mestizaje. In sum, the rapprochement of culture and community is an expression <clears throat> of the pursuit of social justice and citizenship rights for Santos. But as I argued in the expediency of culture, this rapprochement of the two unfinished representations of modernity, the aesthetic, expressive, and the community principles, is an even more pervasive me mechanism of control. They're, they're yoked, they're being articulated together, have become a mechanism of control. In the past three to four decades, progressive activists and theorists who have broken with both the statist and cognitive emphases of traditional Marxism and with commodified and counter-rational modernist inflections of the arts have collapsed aesthetics and community in the formulation of a cultural political alternative to domination. The anthropological turn in the conceptualization of the arts and society is consistent with what might be called cultural power my term that I use for the extension of biopower in the age of globalization, and is also one of the main reasons why cultural policy has become a visible factor in rethinking collective arrangements. The very term cultural policy conjoins what in modernity belonged to emancipation, and on the other hand to regulation, culture, emancipation, policy, regulation. But as I demonstrate throughout the book, the conjoining is perhaps the clearest expression of the expediency of culture. It is called upon to resolve a range of problems for community, which seems only to be able to recognize itself in culture, which in turn has lost its specificity. It has become a resource deployed in a range of initiatives uh, from culture-based urban renovation to generation of intellectual property rights to cultural tourism and to the presumable empowerment, to the presumed empowerment of marginalized communities by wielding of their culture, their heritage, which provides, according to the narratives from UNESCO or rather whatever international cooperation agency you want to take, self-esteem, a platform for the demand of rights, and even the creation of jobs. This brief explanation, or maybe it's not even goes as far as an explanation, but this brief um, overview of the philosophical basis for the emergence of the panoply of initiatives that go by the name of creative or cultural development 
is not usually invoked by cultural, cultural policy managers themselves. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it is there in the background. In any case, one only has to look at the documents of UNESCO, the European Union, the Organization of Ibero-American States, the Organization of American States, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, all their cultural development initiatives to see all this laid out. The issue of precarity, <clears throat> not making a segue, which Andrew raised yesterday, obviously undercuts this paradigm because it is the very creative resource that, or it's, it's the people who are studying and uh, wielding an activism on the basis of precarity, on the experience of precarity, see that the very creative resource, this very creative, is expro ex expropriated in cognitive capitalism when the artist becomes the new model of the worker, as Andrew said. I won't rehearse Andrew's argument since we heard them yesterday, and which I find compelling and agree with. Uh, but I do want to briefly give an account of one approach to precarity that I encountered that makes recourse not to the culture's resource argument that I just broached, but rather recourse to the inherent power in artistic practice as a means of escape from the logic of precarity, or at least a transformation of the conditions what brings about precarity. Rather than culture and creativity, it is the constitutive power that Deleuze and Gattari locate in the molecular and Negri in the Spinozian notion of potentia as opposed to potestas. That is, potestas being the institutionalized power, right? What Foucault had discerned as the power that produces life and in the process governs it. Potestas, I quote uh, from a uh, little piece in, in uh, Negri's book on Spinoza denotate, denotes the centralized mediating transcendental force of command, whereas potentia is the local immediate actual force of constitution, constitutive power. Potentia is the source of opposition, and as such, it is the source of the optimism of the intellect of the Deleuzeans, Gatarians, Negriists, who find in the current stage of capitalism the conditions of its own transformation through constitutive power. I apologize for the brevity of this reference to the molecular and to potentia, because I want to eventually get to other things. Uh, but I do want to get to the issue of precarity and how in this formulation there is hope placed in the power, in, in constitutive power, of one particular understanding of art. I do so because I want to focus on, this, uh, on accounts that are dismissive of this other paradigm of cultural development and a lot of the work that takes place in cultural policy. Uh, and it's not only a dismissal, it's even disdain for notions like creative industry policies, cultural development, diversity, empowerment of communities. These are all very dismissed notions. The disdain for the creative industry's aspect of cultural policy making is not difficult to understand. It simply advances potestas particularly in the conduct of subjectivity and practices such as gaming, social networking, that produce wealth for corporations. The shortcomings, I, I hear I'm rehearsing the argument. I'm not, George Udis is not saying this. <laughs> uh, I'm just echoing it. <laughs> the shortcomings of cultural policy, according to this, are even clearer in culture-based urban development. I mean, they're quite clear, which in the vast majority of cases, have led to gentrification and even the expulsion of those populations that presumably provide the heritage resources that make a neighborhood a target for revitalization, such as the Pelourinho in Salvador da Bahia, which is the central square where uh, one that was populated by a lot of uh, Afro-Brazilians, Afro-Bahians, right, who, whose candomblé and other cultural practices were the reason why this was turned into a particular tourist zone and, gen and, and, re and revitalized. But in the process, the very people who provided that were expelled, and what remained were those people who could provide the service in a very safe environment. So security, particularly security against, in this context, those people who had lived there becomes part of the 
culture-based urban development. So this would be one of the reasons why I can say, well, it's easy to dismiss this particular kind of culture-based urban development. Uh, but there is also disdain for communities that empower themselves through their collective creativity and expression, quite often aided by funding and capacity building provided by NGOs, international cooperation, and in some countries, state subsidies as well. I'll get to those in the second half. Let me exemplify this issue by reference to a seminar that I co-organized at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona in June. Uh, and it helps to know that the museum was built as part of uh, a culture-based development project in one of the poorest and most deteriorated neighborhoods of Barcelona, the Raval, which is, let me get my key. <laughs> it's number five, all right? <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, number one is the Gothic, which had been gentrified and renovated many years before the, the Gothic neighborhood. Uh, and there's a history that goes with this that has to do with the Barcelona model of development. All right? The first piece, although there's a history that goes back to the 19th century for revitalization projects, those in the 19th century based on Hausmann, but 20th century ones going back to 92 in the Olympics, when both the Barceloneta number four and the Villa Olimpica number 17 were totally transformed. Clean, uh, the Barceloneta was a market, was also a place with a lot of uh, red, it was a red light district as well, it was pretty much cleaned up. And 17, the Villa Olimpica was the occupation of a neighborhood, the expulsion of the residents and its transformation. Raval, which is number five, was uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art was built in the Raval by a star architect, uh, Richard Meyer, in, in a neighborhood, in a neighborhood that was very similar to the Gothic neighborhood, old buildings with poor populations, and they were expelled for the creation of this huge white uh, building that's totally out of place in, in, these other, in, in, the, in this urban context. Uh, <clears throat> what's interesting about it, well, I should say also that since the building of the museum, there's been renovation, uh, there's, there's a revitalization projects also in, uh, in number 16, which is Sant'Andreu, and here you get the case of taking over factories, right, and creating cultural centers. That, unlike the, the museum in the Raval, do have more community participation in conflict. The, the museum in, in the Raval was a totally top-down initiative. What's interesting about it, uh, the magma came into being without a museological project and without a collection. Jordi Borja Villel, who became the director at the end of the 90s, transformed that apparent deficit into a site for critical debate on a range of issues, including the relation of art and culture-based revitalization to gentrification. So what's curious is that the very presence of the museum and some of the problems it caused became its museological project to reflect on those and to invite into the museum social movements, particularly uh, squatters, the precariat, and groups that work with migrants. I would not go as far as to say the migrants themselves. If you go to the museum, you'll be hard pressed to see North African, Pakistani, so-and-so migrants in the museum. So there's already something going on. It's when the leadership of certain movements will ally with activist artists, but that the actual population is not a part of that arrangement. But nevertheless, it became a museological project, and an important one. With, uh, I, I can't go into uh, details, but a series of projects, including projects like known as the agencies, that were seeking to wield an agency, create an autonomous space in this area, or another project that really addresses the questions of governmentality, which is, how do we govern ourselves? Right? and inviting the social movements to be a part of this. Um, 
three. My seminar on the economics of culture and the one module that I had within it on molecularity and constitutive power with the European Institute, uh, sorry for the, I don't know how to manipulate images, I mean how to get them off the internet well. I do it on a PC, but on a Mac I have a hard time. <laughs> I, we invited the European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policies, which is not a cultural policy institute like the ones that Kate Oakley works with. But, they, they, no, I say this because basically their foundational texts are Deleuze, Negri, Verno, so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a very different kettle of fish. And, uh, uh, but what is interesting about them is that they've created a, a large network of people who are trying to open autonomous spaces within institutions. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, and of course, what is at the heart of their project is establishing constitutive power. All right, the creation, the production of new subjectivities uh, that are themselves spawned by immaterial and cognitive capitalism and the effects not only within the, the technological class or the, the upper level of the creative class, but in the effects that these initiatives may have in neighborhoods like the Raval, where immigrants or squatters are affected by these issues, also in those cases. Uh, at this meeting, the European Institute for Progressive Cultural Policy expressed the need to negotiate interestingly, with molar right, institutions, like museums, with potestas, what they call monster institutions. So they're monstrous because they're both molecular and molar. All right? They're both potentia and potestas. In order to ratchet up their influence, what they realized is that after the demise of the anti-globalization movement, after the defeat of the immaterial, of the intermittents, in France, after a series of defeats, they start to think, we're the ones who are not doing any kind of marketing. We're not negotiating in institutions. And we have to get our act together if we actually want to get to people. So it was a very interesting meeting where they're seeking to go from the bottom through institutions and have a greater public presence than basically speaking to themselves. Uh, this negotiation and the notion of monster institutions bears out the notion that there is not a hard and fast opposition between molar and molecular, potestas and potentia. That's the usual argument that is made from Deleuze and Gattari on through Negri on Spinoza. Um, but there are preferred social movements, which is one of the things that I want to get at. They're either squatters, migrants, or the precariat. They're not communities that may be making recourse to their heritage in order to uh, gain some ground in their communities and with institutions in the state and negotiating that way. Those are left out of their interest. Um, according to Lazzarato, who was at the meeting and is one of the foundational text writers for the network, for the institute. If the liberal slogan is enrich yourself, the neoliberal slogan is express yourself. This is one of the reasons why there's this um, uh, skepticism towards expressing yourself and your heritage as a means to empower yourself, because it's already a neoliberal injunction. But without, he says, the, the injunction is to express yourself, but that usually comes without the extension of rights to that expression. That is exactly the opposite of what's thought from the cultural development perspective. That is that expression may be a platform for making rights claims. All right, so we'll get to that later. Probably a reaction to non-conflictive notion of public sphere in a lot of culture-based policy making. One of the things is that also that uh, a lot of the cultural policy documents culture industries, UNESCO, more community-based uh, initiatives, do not look at their negotiations and debates as conflictive ones. 
whereas the premise among the uh, Lazzarato, Negri, so on and so forth, is that the public sphere is always a conflictive space as opposed to one where there's harmony. If you look at the UNESCO documents, they talk about toleration, discussion. Well, the toleration exists both in the Floridian and in the UNESCRATS, as, we've, as Toby often calls them. That is that, um, that uh, debate, public debate, is already depoliticized, right? But that's true about these institutional documents. It's not necessarily true about the activities and the mobilization of those communities. There's a difference between what UNESCO says, which provides a space for communities to have some anchoring, and they may be conflictive, they may do a whole series of things, but the UNESCO documents by nature cannot be conflictive because they're intergovernmental and you can never raise conflicts. Uh, in our book, we discuss the question of how uh, the United States and Britain pulled out of UNESCO right, in the 80s, uh, Thatcher and Reagan, and it was precisely over the politicization of, uh, of, of UNESCO. So UNESCO really steers clear of any kind of politicization. Um, now, uh, Lazzarato now draws on, on Duchamp and his position of the, what, what Duchamp called the anartiste, which is neither the avant-garde becoming life, the avant-garde artist becoming, or art becoming life, nor the revolutionary resistant art. It's, it's sort of a withdrawal, a suspension of values. Moreover, Lazzarato connects the anartiste who suspends values with uh, what we might call an, an anoperaio, that is an and worker. If, I don't know how to say that in English. <laughs> it, it, it can work in, in Spanish and in Portuguese, or in, Portu in Portuguese, an operario, sort of the, the an of like anesthetic to the worker, an an worker or a non worker. Or that is the worker whose work is not to be defined by the conditions of employability under capitalism. So there's a connection being made between the anarchist and this withdrawal from the conditions of work. This work is the constitutive power, the one that's being invoked by Lazzarato, uh, of subjectification. And Lazzarato finds that power in Duchamp. I quote, what interests Duchamp is not the creative act, nor the work of art as such, but a subjective mechanism that produces the work of art. It's that subjective mechanism that interests Lazzarato and is the process of social production that is the foundation of art, the artist, the artwork, and the public. That is, what founds all of these categories is in that process. Brian Holmes, who some of you, if those of you that are more in the art, artsy world, right, would know, adds that this uh, kind of process is for those with what he calls substitute identity within these debates. And what does he mean by a substitute identity? He means those people who have an investment in their blackness, their whiteness, their Jewishness, their Muslimness, and communistness or Britishness, that is, people who hark to a community culture uh, framework, uh, or whatever. I'm quoting him. The condition of existence... <laughs> <laughs> the condition of existence in the, communi in the communication society. Like Lazzarato, who finds the solution in Duchamp's practice, Holmes finds it in the work of Francois Deck because he has developed a method, a kind of artistic trick, like the ready-made, that allows him to explicitly bring the sensible world into collective questioning, that is, the suspension of values. If, if one got philosophical, we could talk about the, 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 the reduction, right? Uh, and, but we'll stay out of that realm. But it's a very similar process the, with, with the suspension of, of values. My critique of the Deleuze and Gattari, Negri, Lazzarato, Holmes position is briefly worked out in the paper that you can't, most of you can't read because it's in Portuguese. <laughs> but I want to focus in my concluding section now on the other side of cultural policy making. I'm not going to extend myself too much in this regard, the, the, the value of the anartiste and the art, so on and so forth. But I did want to make that connection between that disdain for community culture formations uh, that comes out of that connection to that to that way of looking at art. Uh, 
But I want to focus now on the other side of cultural policy making, that oriented toward marginalized communities or policies oriented to developing societies. Or it could be to, yeah, marginalized communities in, in the north or developing societies. Let me state first that just as in the UK or Spain, there are several cities in Latin America, just to take Latin America, and Andrew and I are going to discuss this at a greater length, so I'm not going to uh, say everything I have to say about the issue just now. Uh, but there are many cities in Latin America, several cities that have begun to create policies to develop the culture and creative industries. Rio, Sao Paulo, Recife in Brazil, that was going to be called the digital city. Uh, Buenos Aires uh, with Palermo Hollywood and Palermo Soho. In Mexico, Monterrey hosted the second universal forum of cultures, which was, I forgot to mention before, universal forum of cultures in 2004 was the second initiative after the Olympics in 92 to gentrify uh, 17, that is the, the uh, and 18, the Pobleno, the new, the, new, the new town, which is 18, right? The 17, the Villa Olimpica was gentrified in 92, and the process leading up to 2004 gentrified uh, Pobleno right there. Uh, <clears throat> so Monterrey took over the baton and hosted the forum in 2005, I think, or six. Guadalajara, in turn, has a megalomaniac project for the creation of a creative acropolis on a 590-acre site with buildings, 11 buildings, designed by an all-star team composed of Toyo Ito, Zaha Hadid, Jean Nouvel, Daniel Liebeskind, Carmen Pinos, Philip Johnson, Tom Main, and Enrique Norton. All right, so it, it's like big. Huh? I know. Well, it, it was already a design for this before, before he went to meet his maker. <laughs> um, and for the purpose that, like all cities want to do copying Bilbao, except multiplying it by 11 in this case. Right? <laughs> Uh, that will catapult Guadalajara into a globally connected center for the production of knowledge and innovation. Right? It's usual schemes. I should say, just as an aside, uh, which I didn't say, I, I sometimes work like Kate. So I do cultural policy consultation, and I'm working on such a site right now in Santiago de Compostela, where the previous government with Fraga, who's this right-wing uh, fascist, who, who ran the Galician uh, regional government, had uh, commissioned uh, Peter Eisenman to create a nine building, something like 700 million euro site. It got scaled down because they ran out of money to a six building, 400 million euro site on a mountain just outside of Santiago de Compostela. A progressive government, socialist government, came into power recently and they had to, they needed to deal with cultural policy, cultural management issues. What are you supposed to do? Just say, leave the buildings half finished, right? Just because we're socialistically pure? So, so they had to figure out what do we do with this? How do we turn this into something that serves the population uh, in, in, in terms of knowledge production, not for high tech, but for education of youth? Uh, how do we link ourselves with other cities? Uh, they, the, the project was to create an opera house. Galicia, only La Coruña in Galicia has a one-week season of opera. Santiago only has 100,000 people that does not have an opera-going custom. So they transformed that into a multidisciplinary performing arts center, and so on and so forth. So this is what's been happening in, in that particular place. But you could see that. In this case, in, in, in the Guadalajara case, it's private money with what usually happens, means that the broker has of getting public money, but it's led by a private developer. In the case of uh, Santiago, it was totally public money, both European Union, Spanish, and regional government money, that now the socialist government has to uh, rearticulate. <clears throat> so, just as in Spain or other parts of Europe, you see the same kinds in some parts of Latin America. 
same kinds of schemes. I critique projects like these in the paper that I sent last night. After I sent one in Portuguese, then I sent one last night about midnight. So, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> and in that paper, I discussed projects like, aside from uh, the, Guggen, the failed Guggenheim in Rio de Janeiro, or this Guadalajara project, other kinds of projects like Fabela Bayhu, which is uh, a different kind of deployment of architectural resources for poor communities that seek to remedy the segregation wrought by elites instead of gentrification is to re undo the segregation uh, that elites created in order to protect themselves both from the hoi polloi and from organized crime of which there's a lot in Rio uh, as well as the poor behind security systems that turn urban life into societies of control. Under such circumstances, the poor are excluded from the exercise of citizenship and sometimes invade the shielded space of privilege. So even that yields, its, yields conflict because in other parts of uh, that expediency of culture, I deal with the funk, supposed funk riots, which are an invasion of middle class space. The Favelo Bairro project, Bairro in Portuguese means barrio, neighborhood. Favela Bayhu sought to understand the communal and aesthetic value of the Bayhus, of the neighborhoods, and rid them of the stigma of ghettohood. Contrary to the utter absence of any, of the stigma, not necessarily of everyday practices, cultural practices, but of the stigma attached to that. Contrary to the utter absence of any strategy, strategy for linking the Rio Guggenheim with low-income urban development, Favela Bayhu worked with a number of highly esteemed local architects and firms to find solutions in conjunction with community input. Instead of seeking to eliminate favelas, they studied the complexity of informality, the spatial logics and structures of the pre-existing neighborhoods. They discerned modes of community and designed projects that adapted to their topographic and ecological structures, as well as respected the local cultural and symbolic systems. Ongoing dialogue with the communities was standard procedure, and that dialogue extended to the creation of complex networks of heterogeneous actors. So the question of agency was never one of autonomy sort of come down like a deus ex machina out of an, an artistic process, but was always seen as a complex network and a negotiation there and seeing how agency might work on a field of force, of many different forces, in which one does not have all the shots, but in which one tries to get allies to move an agenda. Um, while successful to a degree, now one of the problems of course that such projects of this kind often are not successful on a large scale. In linking favelas with surrounding neighborhoods, the project could not eliminate violence. That's something beyond what architects can do. They cannot take on the narco-trafficking gangs, in large part due to the commanding presence of those gangs who are considered parallel power, right? Like the, well, actually, usually favela residents are between the rock of the police and the hard place of the narco-traffickers. Security becomes a concern and a cultural policy objective, however, in these, in, in, in such situations, not only for the control of criminality, which is understandable from the perspective of elites, and, well, not only elites, even favela residents obviously want criminality, right, controlled but also f new forms of protection for poor communities and for the most at risk populations, such as poor black youth in these communities. The logics of collaboration, consultation, complex networking among heterogeneous actors and valuing the cultural systems of the community have been put into practice by the likes of security specialists like Luis Eduardo Suarez, who has also worked in as an anthropologist with poor communities and who has occupied a number of directorial positions in security at the state, city and national levels. But again, there's trouble because when he occupied the, the Secretary, of State of, of position, Secretary of Security position in, in Rio de Janeiro government, he ran uh, uh, at loggerheads with the uh, chief of police and he had to go into exile to New York. So it's, not, it, it's a very difficult agenda for people who work in this kind of uh, terrain to be able to actually move that mountain. Nevertheless, he's back as the Secretary of Security in uh, uh, Nova Iguazu, where Marcelo's from. 
our Marcelo. Uh, and uh, there he's carrying out those projects with some success. Now, the work of Luis, uh, Luis Eduardo, with Celso Ataigi, who's the guy in the background with the red shirt, and MV Bill, all right, who's the rapper here, and, and shows the collaboration across cultural formations that have to do with music. Celso Ataigi is also a film and new media entrepreneur in the city of God. All right. Uh, and uh, Luis Eduardo, as the Secretary of Security, in finding ways in which to address questions of security in relationship to culture, but also vice versa. It's just, it, this is not leaving aside one of the issues. You can't just do security by having you know, cultural centers. You have to involve security specialists, and including involve the police. And another project I'm not going to discuss here, a group that I wrote about in the Experience of Culture, Afro-Reggae, eventually became negotiators with police and even have a program that working with police and become themselves like Kate, uh, uh, co uh, cultural policy consultants for questions of security. All right, and this is the, well, not, you're not the security person, but a consultant. That is, that the youth who started out uh, organizing in a favela eventually were successful at negotiations, both with narco traffickers and police, that they became a model of and developed even a, a, a program for uh, negotiating with the police. Um, I won't go into too much detail. You could, they have, uh, uh, let me just mention very briefly because I want to just move to end, uh, that Celso Ataigi, who's the producer of a, of a rap label, of a, of a record label, to which, uh, in which uh, both MV Bill and Nega Giza, who are very prominent rap artists from these communities, uh, also was able to get the resources to bring eight filmmaking and video making uh, sets to the favelas so people could go out and make films. One of the films, which was initially seen as a counter city of God, uh, Meninos do Trafico, which is the title of, well, of, of Falcão, that one here, Falcão was one of the uh, narco trafficking leaders, and Meninos do Traffic, uh, Meninos are the, the kids who work as cannon fodder for narco traffickers. It's a book about that they, Sasuata Eiji, who never went to school, and MV Bill is a rapper, actually went to 11 cities in Brazil and did ethnographic work on these issues. Published this book, and it's one of the ways of understanding what is at stake in, in uh, the criminality <coughs> in these neighborhoods. Um, so in any case, I wanted just to show that the kind of work that's being done here is not a top-down. It's, it's not a, a Florida who comes, Richard Florida, and says, you know, this is the initiative to do, or even a Landry, but it's really a networked kind of solution. It is that, that, that uh, whether it's MV Bill or the kids from Afro Reggae, networking with someone like Luis Eduardo, who's on the right there, uh, who's this, who was the Secretary of Security, with different actors, whether they're politicians or international cooperation agencies, right? whether they're the Dutch, the Germans, or the Spanish, uh, in a very complex network, moving agendas along. Agendas that will uh, invoke much of the rhetoric that, find, that one finds in UNESCO and many other institutions, but that are doing all kinds of work that is not beholden just to that rhetoric, all right? So one of, uh, I'm, I'm going to end here. I had other things to uh, discuss, but maybe they would be more relevant uh, when Andrew and I, because they involve two cities, Bogotá and Medellín, with which both very violent cities, and they've been totally transformed, and I think that would be interesting to discuss later. But what I wanted to say is that uh, this idea of complex networks where Ideas like governmentality themselves do not hold. There's, there's a lot of leakage in such notions. Th there's, there's one good example that, that one sees in movie houses throughout Latin America. One goes to the movies, and I don't know if you've seen it, uh, 
before the movie's shown, uh, you see a scene that uh, uh, there's, there's a short, and a mother comes in to her, to the grandmother of the kid, to the, her mother and, and the kid, and she says, look what I brought. I brought a film. She says, where'd you get it? Oh, I just bought it on a you know, pirate spot on the street. And the mother and the grandmother says, well, isn't that illegal? So, it doesn't matter. And the, at that moment, the kid gets up and starts going outside to play. And she, the mother says, where are you going? And she says, I'm going out to play. He says, but did you study for your exam tomorrow? He says, oh, I've got that solved. What do you mean? I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, well, and then there's a voiceover. What are you teaching your children? What do the public answer? To save money. <laughs> so, so when you're thinking of when you're thinking of that these governmentality arrangements are like uh, really sealed tight and actually produce subjectivities as they think they do, one has to look on the ground, not at just the discourse, that it doesn't necessarily function that way. Same thing for UNESCO discourse, so on and so forth. And that's what I'm trying to get at. What I find is that the, the purest anartiste discourse is assuming that people really function according to such discourse. And behavior, particularly when one looks at complex networks, this field of force, has this kind of play that, uh, that has different outcomes that result from that. And I'll leave the, the other examples that have to do with Bogotá and Medellín for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.